My name is Chris Hatley. I'm CEO of the Academy of the Social Science in Australia. Thank you very much uh, to everyone who's come along today, both our panellists and our participants. And it's nice to see some familiar names in our, in our attendee list there as well. This is the fifth in our series of webinars on social sciences and space that has been convened by Professor Roy McLeod and Claire McFarland. I'm just gonna introduce um, a few housekeeping matters, but before I do that, and before I hand over to Roy to introduce our series and our panelists, I wanted to share an acknowledgement of country video that we've made for this purpose. So give me a second. Wherever you are across Australia, we acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians, custodians of, of this land. land. The Darug peoples. The Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. The, the Gundungurra, Gundungurra people, people of the, the Southern, Southern Highlands. The Ngunnawal people of the Canberra region on whose country we are standing. And all other peoples of this vast continent their ongoing connection through custodianship of its land and waters, physical and spiritual, through culture, language and ceremony. Where sovereignty was never ceded, we pay our respects to elders past, present and still to come. Thank you, and uh, I acknowledge the Ngunnawal people as the traditional owners of the land where I'm joining from in Canberra. I would like to now introduce Professor Roy McLeod as the convener of the series. Um, Roy is a fellow of the Academy of the Social Sciences in Australia and the Academy of Humanities in Australia. And he has um, pulled together this fantastic webinar series. He's going to tell us a bit about that and then introduce our moderator and panellists. Thank you, Roy. Thank you, Chris, and uh, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Good morning from Sydney, where I am sitting in isolation at home. Uh, greetings also uh, from where I am in, in the Camaralgara uh, traditional uh, homeland uh, to welcome you to our uh, fifth series, uh, our, our fifth session in the series on Australia's future in space and emerging agenda for the social sciences. Uh, I'm a historian of science and of global history and an emeritus professor of history at uh, Sydney. And as one born in the Kennedy generation who has lived with space for most of his life, I embarked upon this exercise in order to share with you as much as I can my interest and passion in the adventure of, of space and my concern for its future di di direction for, and its outcome. Some may say that to launch a series of this kind in the midst of a pandemic, which is for many reasons not the best idea. Certainly in no way must we let our attention be distracted from the urgencies of the day. But for just a moment, this hour, I would like to invite you to sit with me and let us slip the surly bonds of earth and to consider what might be awaiting us and may well be upon us even before the end of the present decade, even more especially in the domains that you yourselves are, are professionally consider. For many uh, of us, uh, the idea that we will be an active in space, active participants in space adventure is a given. And during the last couple of years, few will have missed the rapid series of space related events occurring around the world. In 2019, we celebrated the 50th anniversary of the lunar landing. In 2020, the International Space Station celebrated its 20th anniversary. And this year alone, there have been no fewer than 11 significant space missions so far. In March, we saw the success of SpaceX, and in June, news of NASA's commercial payload services um, opening, I think, uh, an agenda that few of us would think would happen in our lifetimes. And certainly the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope to replace Hubble uh, next month, we are told, um, will be uh, transformative in all sorts of ways too. We're learning so much so rapidly. 
All these uh, things that we are learning, though, are very much the work of science and technology on a grand scale. We have less pub public knowledge, at least, about what's being learned in the life sciences and in the biological sciences. And I'm particularly anxious that we cultivate uh, this part of our spectrum. Uh, perhaps we've been preoccupied a little bit, a lot, in the last two weeks or so by the developments in the commercialization of space, particularly space tourism, led off by Jeff Bezos and Richard Branson, and soon I'm sure to be followed by Elon Musk and others, from which we derive very quickly the notion that space is a very human enterprise, replete with human stories of competition and controversy, and some begin to see, I think, quite rightly, a danger of first principles and possibilities being ruined, certainly being rushed by commercialization and uh, opportunism, raising questions about the ethics and behavior that should frame our presence in space. Of course, meanwhile, the hard work of space diplomacy has proceeded. Nations have long debated the need to strengthen the uh, promise of the Outer Space Treaty, and so far, 12 countries have become signatories to the Artemis Accords. And uh, this is all in the right direction, but it's still at a very general level. And in some respects, we have yet to begin to think more closely about the social and human aspects of space exploration, of commerce, the possibility of settlement, and what's involved in living there, not just getting there, as it were, <laughs> going there and getting there, but being there. How are, to we conduct, how are we to conduct ourselves and how are, to we, how are we to behave towards the new environments that we will encounter? How will our interaction with space altogether, which is driven in, in, inevitably by the few, come to benefit the many? Well, such questions force us to reflect upon the role that the social sciences ought to play in this conversation hand in hand with the natural sciences, medicine and technology. And in this act of reflection, I believe it's also time to fashion a focus on Australia and on Australia's present and potential participation in the enterprise. As historians such as Kerry, Doherty and others have recorded, Australia actually has a long history of engagement with space. And since 2018, as you all know, we have our own space agency uh, setting regulatory regimes, and I hope uh, programs that will open new frontiers. Uh, I'm, <coughs> I'm sure you share with me a view that we have excellent media coverage and several centers devoted to space law and strategy as well. Uh, we are hopeful, I think, of much uh, deeper introspection and reflection as academics, I think we call, we're called upon to ask even more fundamental questions, not only about the how and the when, but also about the whether and the why, and to the ends to be achieved and the consequences we must confront. We have also to ask, I think, in whose interest do we as Australians venture first to the moon and then to Mars and beyond? It's to these questions that the whole series is devoted. Nine moderators and their teams have accepted our invitation to draw upon their respective discourses of culture, history, medicine, health, heritage, law, diplomacy, industry, all with reference to the practicalities of living in space. And at the very end of the series, to which I invite you please to come, we've asked two generations of young Australians, including recent graduates and some still in school, to join us and to reflect upon the prospect of their own space-faring futures. We hope you will enjoy and participate in these conversations through chat, as Chris has indicated, through the chat mechanism. All sessions will be recorded and made available for later viewing. Warm acknowledgements at this moment go to all members of our team and to the many who have helped us uh, get through these early technical difficulties and these difficult times. At the moment, let me just begin by uh, thanking Chris uh, Heatherly and the Academy of the Social Sciences and my colleagues in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Sydney. Our guides uh, through the uh, IT world, Jose Taralba and Jacob Craig, and most especially, my colleague, 
Miss Claire McCollin for getting us safely underway. This morning, um, I have the pleasure of welcoming as our moderator, Professor Gordon Cable, Australia's leading specialist in aerospace medicine <coughs> and head of the Aerospace um, Medicine Training um, Institute, the RAF. He's also um, currently advising the Space Agency on developing a roadmap in the subject of living systems, uh, which is, of course, close to our hearts and certainly relevant, germane to this morning's webinar. May I then, at this moment, welcome Gordon to take, take the chair, take the floor, and speak to us and introduce the speakers. Thank you. Roy, thank you so much for that introduction and, and welcome and uh, welcome to everybody participating in the webinar today uh, in what hopefully will be a very interesting look at uh, humans and how humanity can live successfully in space. Uh, this webinar on uh, particularly Australia's contribution uh, and how we can uh, participate in international efforts to see uh, humans living and uh, succeeding and thriving uh, sustainably uh, in space into the future. Uh, humans, as Roy have men has mentioned already, have not really ventured uh, as far from Earth uh, since the 1960s and 70s as we will be in the next uh, decade or two. Uh, we will be venturing beyond the, the, the cradle of uh, Earth's protection, beyond our magnetic uh, field, uh, into the, the depths of space, to the moon and to Mars, where the physical and environmental challenges are much greater than we've had to encounter over the last uh, 20 or 30 years in low Earth orbit. We will be facing greater challenges of microgravity, of radiation, of isolation, confinement, closed hostile environments um, uh, like we, we haven't faced before, the distance from Earth as well, providing problems of resupply and survival away from our home planet. So looking at how living systems can can live, can live and survive sustainably in these environments, I think there are three very um, important areas to consider, which would be physical health, uh, their mental and behavioural well-being, and nutritional support uh, at a distance from Earth where resupply is not possible. So the speakers that I've uh, invited along today are looking at those three important areas. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers who will be speaking on those topics. Firstly, from the University of Adelaide Weight Research Institute, we have Professor Matthew Gilliam, uh, who will be speaking to us about plants in space as an essential source of nutrition, of pharmaceuticals and material for sustaining long-term habitation. Uh, Matthew, originally from a postdoctoral fellowship and PhD from the University of Cambridge, uh, came to Adelaide and has been working with the Wade Institute, which is really a world leading uh, centre for agriculture, food and wine innovation here. But he has a really keen interest in, of course, our uh, ability to grow plants to sustain humans in space. Also joining us from the University of South Australia is Professor Siobhan Banks, who is a Professor of Psychology and she is the Director of the Behaviour Brain Body Research Centre at UniSA, and she has been working in the fields of biology, behaviour and technology uh, for many years, particularly looking at how humans can manage stress and fatigue and optimise their performance uh, in critical industries such as healthcare, transport and defence, uh, and, and in fact, space as well. Siobhan is a member of our technical advisory group with the Australian Space Agency currently. Uh, and finally, Dr John Cherry, also a member of our technical advisory group, uh, a medical doctor, is uh, on the board of the Australasian Society of Aerospace Medicine and chairs ASAM's Space Life Sciences Committee. Uh, John has had the um, good fortune to work for NASA and ESA uh, on, a, um, on different occasions, uh, developing medical support programs and training for astronauts uh, with those organisations and remains quite engaged in space medicine research. And in fact, even today joins us from Davis Station in Antarctica, where he is, uh, is the doctor down there. And if there's no better space analogue than Antarctica, I'd, I'd like to see it. So uh, without further ado, Matthew, I might hand over to you to prevent, uh, provide the first presentation and, uh, and share your slides if you wish. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, delightful to speak um, to you today. So thank you to the Academy. Thank you to Gordon and Roy for inviting me to speak and for that uh, generous introduction. 
So yes, I'm based at the Weight Research Institute and we're the largest uh, concentration of agricultural researchers in the Southern Hemisphere. But today I'll talk to you about our programs that we're running in Plants for Space. This is something that we've been doing for the last couple of years. It's much bigger though than our own research. We're collaborating with researchers at the Trobe University, the University of Melbourne, and the University of Western Australia here in Australia, but also with space agencies around the world and a number of research groups and companies around the world as well. So today I'll briefly go through, I'll only have 10 minutes and I'll cover why plants are obviously important, why do we need plants in space, what is the state of the art currently, so what is possible about plant growth in space, what might be possible in the future, and how can this help us on Earth. So I'm sure that the audience doesn't need, to, uh, need me to tell you how important plants are for life here on Earth. We wouldn't be here without them. So obviously they produce our food that we eat, and we feed our animals that we also eat and also uh, enjoy in other ways. They produce our oxygen. They produce materials that we wear and that we use for building. We can use them for pharmaceutical or medicine production and fuels. And not to be underestimated is obviously their, their beauty as well and the psychological benefits that come from having plants around. And this is particularly so, um, as you'll hear, in space as well. So we depend upon them here on Earth. We're reliant for them um, on, for our physical and mental well-being. Astronauts obviously live in a, a different environment, a closed system, and they have to take everything with them to survive and thrive. There are problems and uh, challenges associated with that. One of them is cost. It costs about $25,000 to blast a one kilogram payload up into space. And um, they do that quite regularly. So every month or so, when we um, talk about food, there is a resupply of the space station with, uh, with food. And to maximize both the packing of that food into the, the rockets, but also to maximize the amount they put on the space station, they remove from not all the food, but um, quite a lot of it, a lot of the water. And uh, that might be uh, okay for something like a dehydrated apple or the like, but the uh, diet can become quite monotonous. And so some of the astronauts live six to 12 months in the space station. And every month or so when there is the resupply of this dehydrated or thermostabilized food, the, uh, the thing that the astronauts really look forward to are the fresh fruit and vegetables they get as treats as well. So they don't uh, dial up a, a pizza or a hamburger, they want fresh fruit and vegetables when the resupply happens. Resupply is not so much a problem as Gordon alluded to. Um, the space station is only 420 kilometers its nearest point away from us. And so that's fairly easy to resupply. When we're talking about Mars, we're talking about 56, to 56 million kilometers away which is a much more significant problem for resupply, both in cost and the logistics of actually getting there. So here we're talking about a nine month uh, trip in the first instance and at least a three year round trip. And there are a number of showstoppers associated with that. The, the technology to actually get people there, we're not there quite yet, but it's certainly, and you could argue a lot more advanced than the ability to supply the nutrition for the astronauts. The quantity of food for a, a crew of four for a three year uh, mission to Mars will need to pack about 10 tons of food. And that's simply not possible with the current technology. There's talk of supplying, in fact, of blasting food to Mars in advance, and that will require a five year stability of that food. And quite simply, the nutritional stability of food, the technology to keep that uh, stable, the certain nutrients and vitamins that are required for optimal human health, that is not yet possible. The timeline here, so by 2030, we should have established or plan to establish the Lunar Gateway through Axiom. 
And the, the next decade, up till 2040, there's a period of testing of the uh, sustainability systems. And by 2040, we should be, or is planned to send missions to Mars. What I, I've described to you is a problem in terms of sustained nutrition for long-term space habitation. I could uh, argue some more, but I think I'll, I'll hand over to one of the astronauts on the space station and they can hopefully outline some of the, the problems too. Having lived on the space station here for a while, I understand the, uh, the uh, logistical complexity of having uh, people live and work in space for long periods and the, uh, the supply chain that is required to keep us going. And if we're ever going to go to Mars someday, we will. And uh, but whatever that is, we're going to have to have a spacecraft that is much more uh, self-sustainable uh, with regards to its uh, food supply. Cheers! 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 Cheers. 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 <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Good. Thanks, good. So there you can see the, the joy of uh, having uh, nutrition produced on the, uh, the space station, and that's a, a crop of uh, lettuce that they were eating harvest a few years ago with uh, Scott Kelly and his colleagues. And there's an undi undeniable need that we will need to produce nutrition on the way uh, to Mars and beyond. And further than that, we will need to produce medicine and materials in situ and on demand to uh, cope with unforeseen uh, medical issues. We'll also need to obviously have purification of air and water. Plants can obviously do all of these things and more, and that's the technologies that we're developing uh, currently to sustain, to, to enable long-term space habitation. One of the major issues here is that plants did not evolve to grow in space, and there's many challenges associated with space environments. Gordon alluded to the cosmic radiation is one, high CO2, both on the space station, it's about 3,000 parts per million, just under. We're concerned here on Earth about uh, CO2 levels of about 600 parts per million. Microgravity is also an issue, and plants obviously did not uh, evolve to grow in those conditions. What might it look like? So this, unfortunately, is a Photoshop mock-up of what uh, growing plants in space might look like. That would be a, an ideal situation. The state of the art is more like this. We're talking about a one, millimeter, a one meter cubed growing volume. So one single tray of plants, in both the advanced plant habitat and the veggie system currently. So the ability for us to grow plants currently in space is both um, is constrained by space in terms of physical space volume and mass on the space station, but also the biology of the plants. Equally, if we were to grow them on Mars, does it look like um, Matt Damon's setup in The Martian or The Botanist, if you uh, prefer the book? Plants won't be grown on the surface because of those issues. In fact, the, uh, the parts per million of CO2 on Mars is more like 900,000 um, rather than 3,000 on the space station. We'll be growing them under the surface to protect from those kind of environments, including the um, radiation as well. Some of the things that we're working on is uh, for pick and eat crops that grow very quickly, that have the form to be compact, that have optimal nutrition, that are resource efficient. One of the important things here is obviously you can see the crop here of tomatoes, you eat the fruit, but what do you do with the rest of the plant? So we're developing technologies that allows the plants to have minimal waste, whether we use them for nutritional sources, material sources, or recycling into other forms. We're working on processing these kinds of food into multiple forms of taste, texture, and improve nutrient stability, improve flavors for multiple food forms, as well as obviously coping with the uh, conditions of space. For the uh, Mars surface or other planet surfaces, we'll probably be growing underground, as I said, and this kind of setup is not too dissimilar from controlled environment agriculture setups here on Earth. And our technologies will be, at least some of them, for our quickly growing, low waste, 
nutrient efficient plants will be applicable here on earth to improve sustainability of agriculture here on earth. Certainly in conditions that uh, don't have ready, uh, ready supply of nutrition, but also for improving the, uh, the carbon footprint and uh, of agriculture by perhaps rewilding some of the, the environments on earth that are devoted and low productivity um, wise in terms of agriculture. Last slide, we'll be talking here about new technologies, and this uh, may be of interest, particularly to some of the audience, and invoking new technologies and what we can do with plants. So as well as using GM and gene editing for adapting plants for these unusual environments, we can use plants for much more than just food and introduce things like novel medicines and plastics and building materials and uh, have those on demand. So this is the summary slide. I'll just very quickly go through this. We're developing plants as a, a platform to sustain long-term space habitation, to improve uh, the nutritional and physical well-being of astronauts, the monotonous diet of pre-packaged thermostabilized foods, astronauts lose weight, the supplementary diets that can be brought in through these fruits and vegetables, and even dependent later on in the years to come, on growing plants for nutrition, that leads to better outcomes in terms of intake. There are mental well-being issues as well. People just like having plants around, tending to plants, and this brings a lot of satisfaction. I talked about materials and pharmaceuticals. The state of the art to where we are now is nowhere near where we need to be, and so that's why we need these long-term programs that we're leading here in Australia for developing plants for space. And there are also benefits that can be brought back here on Earth. So thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to hearing the other panellists give their talks and then engaging with you in the question and answer session later. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Matt. That was, uh, that was fascinating. And a lovely segue there, the mental health benefits of plants uh, segue into our next speaker. I'd like to reintroduce Professor Siobhan Banks from University of South Australia. Siobhan, uh, I'd like to invite you to speak to the uh, issue of managing psychosocial risks for humans in space. Over to you. Thank you very much, Gordon. And thank you to the Academy for the invitation to speak today. It's, I think this is a fantastic panel uh, and agree that uh, my talk comes very nicely after Matthew's. I will just share my screen. So as Gordon said, I'm going to talk today about some of the psychosocial risks. I am uh, I'm an experimental psychologist by background, so very interested in behaviour um, and how we might understand how these different environments affect people and their mental health. I'm not a clinical psychologist, but obviously by understanding behaviours, we really can, uh, can help people manage being in these unique environments. And obviously, there's quite a lot of uh, unique constraints travelling into space in, in all its different levels. Um, so I'm the director of the Behaviour Brain Body Research Centre at UniSA, and we do a lot of different research, particularly with 24-7 industries around how to manage uh, stress and fatigue and how to uh, enable people to optimise their performance in these often quite unusual environments. And so space, in a way, is, is the ultimate uh, unusual environment in terms of the constraints that it will um, and the pressures that will put on to people. Um, these are all some great photographs from the uh, space station, the International Space Station. Um, and I think one of the things that is really important to note is how um, the space station, while extremely functional, um, has a lot of constraints on the way people are able to live in that particular space. Um, particularly, you know, a topic which is close to my heart is around the sleep. And as you can see here, we have an astronaut trying to sleep in um, his sleeping bag, um, but effectively is actually, uh, you know, hanging off the side of his little sleep environment stuck there with Velcro to stop him floating around. And it's something that we take for granted on Earth, such as sleep, which is so vital to our, our health and our well-being, um, is very difficult to achieve on, on station and in space. 
um, we see that sleep is disrupted because of the noisy environment, but also because being in the microgravity environment is actually very difficult to sustain sleep. So something that is just so basic and fundamental to our, our health and our well-being is disrupted on a regular basis. Um, and these are part of why these risks uh, have been identified by NASA as part of the human performance program as being particularly important. And Gordon mentioned some of these in the introduction. Um, uh, but particularly what you see is that the, um, the risks around isolation, distance from Earth and the hostile close environment are ones that are particularly um, important for humans and, and, and have a lot of uh, uh, consequences for humans. Obviously, radiation and gravity fields are also vitally important and, uh, and have a lot of impact on our health overall. Um, but we see that in the isolation distance from Earth and the closed and hostile environments, um, one, psycholo one psychology and one psychosocial kind of uh, health are really impacted um, by those particular risks. So when we're thinking of uh, the different uh, environments that we might have to embark in when we're travelling um, through space, we know quite a lot um, now about what it's like to live on the space station. There's been some fantastic research over the past few years, in particularly looking at some of the psychosocial risks. For example, even if we just take sleep, we know quite a lot about how sleep is impacted by being on station. And in that particular environment, there's um, uh, you're relatively close to Earth, so we're able to resupply, as, as Matthew was talking about. We're able to get some of those fresh foods. We're able to still see Earth. Uh, and those things all uh, um, have a different impact on the way we might experience that as part of the environment uh, compared to going to the moon or indeed to Mars. And for long duration space travel, heading out um, to Mars, where we really are going to have to be very much on our own. And I'm sure John's going to be talking a little bit more about this in terms of um, the remoteness and dealing with, you know, uh, that from a health perspective, from a psychological one, that distance, that space, and that uh, not being in connection to home anymore is going to have a lot of impacts that I think while we're trying to understand some of those on Earth, we still don't fully understand um, the real impact that that's going to have over a several year period being cut off from our home planet. And so if we're thinking about what some of those demands might be, um, there's a list here that I've put together just in terms of what some of the more um, uh, uh, known ones would be. Obviously, there, is, there are going to be some other impacts on psychological health that where we will have to manage as, as time passes uh, and people venture further into space. But some of these that are really being looked at, um, in particular by NASA at the moment, are around the groups and the group size and team dynamics. There's this idea that um, the right stuff, you perhaps remember um, that uh, uh, from um, the uh, you know, early uh, ventures into space and trying to understand humans, we were really um, and still are quite focused around um, there, there needs to be the right kind of people. And that will absolutely make a big difference, the right team dynamics, the right people, the right motivations. But also there are biological constraints that we're understanding about human behaviour now that we will all carry with us. And so what's really important is to understand how we can support resilience and psychological resilience through that as well. The extended duration in confined environments and that remote and isolated piece is very, very important. Um, and that is an unusual piece. We're able to um, research some on Earth, and I'll speak a little bit in the moment about some of the analogues where we can um, investigate the impact of being stuck in an environment with a small group of people together for long periods of time and, and how that impacts our health. Um, and as time progresses and we're developing better technology, we understand that we're going to be able to have a whole range of systems, uh, robotic interfaces, but also various different um, computer-aided systems that we will need to um, interact with and how they might change uh, and be impacted by a long duration period in space is, is very important. Um, these missions are going to create a lot of stress on the individuals. 
fatigue, yes, as I've said, because of being in, um, in an environment that's not terribly conducive to sleep, but also from a, um, a stress perspective in terms of the visibility of the missions and the stress of being in these unusual environments. And I think one of the really important areas to focus on research, and indeed where some of ours has been um, in recent years, is around uh, recovery. That idea of how, what are the right kinds of schedules for people to work on? How can we um, augment recovery through um, the right types of rest and relaxation opportunities? How might diet and food play a big role in that as well to support rest and recovery and recuperation? And also the um, light and activity cycles, how we might be able to create better environments um, in the habitats that we're going to be in space, um, augmented by light, and how we might be able to use exercise and activity as well. So on Earth, we're investigating a lot of these various different um, uh, impacts, but also countermeasures on how we might be able to um, better manage um, some of these risks with a range of different, these are just a small handful of the different kinds of analogues that are um, being currently used on Earth to try and examine um, how behaviour might change. I've been involved with my research in two of them, with, with NEMO and also Mars 500. NEMO is a, um, a the Nautilus extreme environment. It's off the Florida coast, it's 30 metres down. It's a little habitat uh, on a coral reef. Um, and what's great about this environment, it's very small and confined and the astronauts go and train there. They can only get there by diving down. And obviously there's a delay in their ability to um, receive and, and um, get services. In that environment, we've had them perform performance tests, um, undergo cognitive tasks and also try and understand what it's like living in that confined environment from a psychological perspective. And same with Mars 500, that was a, uh, a study that was conducted, uh, finished a number of years ago now. It was a um, 500 days that that crew you see there in the photograph um, lived together. And we saw some very interesting effects around people's timing of their sleep in that particular environment. We saw that some people stayed quite organised in their timing, while others actually uh, became quite um, disorganised in their timing. And they found it very difficult to maintain their mood and their um, normal uh, uh, sleep timing to the daylight cycle. And of course, there are other environments as well. Antarctica, I know John will talk about that as he's experiencing it right now. Um, I wanted to show the Mars Desert Research Station from a perspective of an internal floor plan to understand how small a lot of these environments are. And so we're really trying to um, overlay the confinement and those kinds of issues that you will be experiencing in space here on Earth. Some of the work that we've been doing around um, these countermeasures is working with um, our industrial design team at UniSA to better understand how we might be able to um, improve habitable environments. And this is actually work we're conducting at the moment um, with uh, DST Group, Defence Science and Technology Group, for the Future Submarine Program, where um, uh, doing design exemplars, trying to explore the ways that we might be able to augment um, some of the various different habitable environments on the submarines to improve health and well-being. Really trying to take a whole platform approach to managing stress and fatigue, how we might be able to layer in things like lighting, understand um, space constraints, better use of things in the environment so that for people having to live in these unusual environments for long periods of time, small things don't become a huge irritation or source for conflict. Um, we can't expect people to perform at their best if we don't um, enable an environment um, and reduce some of those sources of conflict. So we, we develop these design exemplars and we test them with experimental psychology approaches so that we know we're using an evidence-based approach to um, implementing some of these countermeasures rather than just say plucking a colour that we think might be nice to paint on the walls. We're really trying to understand whether these environments, these things that we change and manipulate have benefits for performance and well-being. And I think, you know, there's a number of things that we can consider in into the design, um, how we might be able to personalise and customise these environments for astronauts. 
um, and to really help have that connection to home. Because I know that, you know, being, for example, on the space station in the Kapula has has a, a real impact on people's well-being. Um, and so how do we uh, develop that experience in the future in um, long duration space flight? And my final slide here, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the other work we're doing around the biometrics and tracking of performance. Um, these devices and wearables are all things that we can use to understand how behaviour might change over time. And in an environment for a long duration space flight, what we would be looking at is how um, perhaps people's stress levels or how their facial expressions are changing over time to, to indicate whether they're um, mood is also altering. And these unobtrusive ways enable us to understand how people's um, mood dynamics may change over time. For example, uh, if someone hasn't smiled for several weeks, this could be an indication that something is, is up with their mental health. And looking at their wearables, um, investigating, uh, we're doing work looking at ways we might be able to uh, better use sensors in clothing or on skin to track physiology um, that could tell us about cognitive performance. And also uh, for interactions between people, looking at sensors to detect how closely people are interacting with each other to understand uh, whether conflicts are developing uh, between individuals. So there's really a lot of work still to be done here. And I think from a technology um, perspective, there's a lot that Australia can offer into this um, space uh, and trying to help manage some of the psychosocial risks for space travel and into the future. So I will finish there um, and uh, pass back to Gordon. Wonderful. Thank you, Siobhan. Uh, fascinating topic and very relevant to the social sciences, of course. Uh, an equally important topic, though, of course, is physical health and medical care. Uh, and uh, to speak to that topic, I'd like to invite Dr. John Cherry uh, to share his slides and to uh, join us um, with his presentation. Thanks, John. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you very much uh, to the Academy for the opportunity to present today. Uh, as was discussed earlier, I'm speaking to you from uh, Davis Station in Antarctica, which is um, the, part of the Australian Antarctic Program um, and is probably the one of the best space analogue environments uh, in the world. Um, and the Australian Antarctic Program are certainly world leaders when it comes to space analogue environments and the work that we conduct down here. So it's a, a pleasure to have the opportunity to, to speak with you uh, uh, from Davis Station. Um, I'll be <clears throat> speaking about some of the challenges of long duration space flight from a medical perspective um, on behalf of the Australasian Society of Aerospace Medicine. Um, before I do that, I, I think it's always important to recognise some of the resources that we have in Australia, uh, and a really important resource is the Virtual Institute of the, uh, which is the Centre for Antarctic Remote and Maritime Medicine. Uh, it's a virtual institute supported by the uh, Australian Federal Government, uh, the uh, Tasmanian Government, and the University of Tasmania with the Menzies Institute um, for uh, for Medical Research, uh, based in the Antarctic Gateway City of Hobart. Uh, and there are some really exciting things that are, are coming out of CALM. Uh, one of those things is looking at space medicine and there are a range of opportunities in, in space medicine coming out of CALM for people who are interested. So if you are interested, please do have a look at the website. Uh, they've got some great stuff on there, including information about um, cutting edge hypo hyperbaric chamber at uh, uh, Royal Hobart Hospital, which has opened up last year, uh, and a range of information about Antarctica as a space analogue environment. So what I'll do is in my you know, short 10 minutes, I'll uh, try and mention some of the issues from a medical perspective um, that we will face on a long duration uh, mission. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, we'll assume that's a, pres we'll assume that's a mission to Mars. Um, and we're looking at it from specifically a medical perspective. So as Siobhan was saying, one of the big issues that we have is um, independence of the crew. So latency is a really big issue and it's something that we often see in sort of Hollywood productions, but the impact is often perhaps not thought about in great detail. Depending on where the different orbits are, the latency for a mission to Mars could be anywhere between six and 40 minutes of delay, um, more likely towards the 40 minute uh, end. And so that means that if a 
crew uh, needs to ask a question of the ground, uh, they could expect a 40-minute delay uh, before they get an answer. <laughs> now, if you think about a, uh, a crew on board the International Space Station, if they have a medical emergency, they'll call, call down to their flight surgeon on the ground at Houston uh, and they'll ask for some medical advice. Even if there is a, an astronaut on board who's a doctor, they'll still ask for that advice and, and bring the ground team into whatever's happening. But if there's a medical emergency and you have to wait 40 minutes to get an answer, well, you need to be able to treat that medical emergency uh, independently. Uh, that has an impact on the type of astronauts you select, the type of training that occurs, um, and the resources that the astronauts have in order to deal with the medical emergency. So increased independence and increased medical skill among the group and increased training demands associated with that are a big uh, part of a, a future Mars mission, and that all comes back to the, the latency, the delay in communications. Another factor to consider, which is a really important one, is uh, radiation. And we know that um, high altitude pilots experience radiation. We know that astronauts experience increased amounts of radiation. Um, but as we go further away from Earth and further away from the uh, protections that Earth affords us, uh, we need to think about radiation of two different sources, both solar particles, so emissions from the sun, and those can be large emissions or sort of sequential emissions that occur on a regular basis, uh, or they can be uh, galactic cosmic rays, which is galactic background radiation. For a, an astronaut that travels from Earth to Mars, they can well expect to have a lifetime radiation exposure. So in other words, they'll exceed their lifetime safe limit of radiation exposure for that trip. That poses problems, obviously, because we know that there's an association between radiation exposure um, and malignancy. Uh, the effect of that on astronauts is still being studied and the, the results of that aren't uh, for public release. Um, or aren't publicly available, I should say. Um, but the reality is that the radiation exposure not only affects the, the astronauts' health and potentially um, their long-term health when they get back to Earth, but it also affects mission planning as well. If we uh, need to train an astronaut and we put them in, in space aboard the International Space Station uh, for six months and then plan to send them to Mars once they've um, had some familiarity with spaceflight, well, we would... Uh, well exceed their lifetime uh, radiation safe exposure dose. So the radiation shielding and, 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 and mitigation strategies are really important for long-term health um, and also to, to make sure that we're optimising our mission profiles as well. So bone and muscle loss is another big thing in, in space medicine um, and you could, uh, well, there are several PhDs written about this. You could talk about this for a long time. In short, the human body is not designed to be in a microgravity environment. And for every uh, minute, hour, day, month, week that it's in a microgravity environment, uh, the changes are occurring and uh, astronauts are losing bone density and they're losing muscle bulk. Um, that's why aboard the space station, they'll uh, exercise for up to two and a half hours a day. And that's protected uh, exercise time. It's why before they go to space, they have an optimised exercise regime to ensure that they're doing the best that they can to optimise their physical, uh, physical health. Um, but still, within a 5 to 11 day period in space, you'll get a 20% loss in, in muscle mass. Complicated further is the machines that we currently use aboard the space station, like the, uh, this is a modified weightlifting machine uh, called the ARED, and this works really well. Uh, but you can see it takes up quite a lot of volume there. You can see the astronaut in the photo there is basically doing a deadlift of a weight. And that, that works really well for maintaining bone density and, and maintaining muscle bulk. But it also, the, the volume that it takes up isn't sustainable and isn't achievable to put into a, um, a craft that is going to transit to Mars. It's fine aboard the space station where space is more of a premium, but it, where you have uh, greater restrictions around uh, physical space within a, in a spacecraft, these sorts of machines need to be altered in their design. Um, and they're a, 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 an essential uh, risk mitigation strategy to try and maximise astronaut health for such extended periods in, in space. 
We also have a, uh, a significant ongoing issue with pharmaceuticals or, or drugs. Um, NASA acknowledges that they don't have a good understanding of medication use amongst astronauts, of um, the, the efficacy of, of medications when they're provided and the side effect, side effect profile. But we also have issues around uh, expiry of medications. And if you go to a, a pharmacy and, and, and uh, you know, pick up a, a pill off the shelf, the chances are it will roughly probably expire within about 12 months. Well, we're talking about missions that are going to last several years. And so we need to know what the efficacy of that medication is um, two, three years down the track. Can we extend the shelf life of the med medication? Will it still have active metabolites in it? Will the side effects be greater? Will the uh, dose need to be increased because there are less active metabolites? Um, and these are recognised as significant knowledge deficits by um, those involved in human spaceflight at NASA and something that's being actively researched at the moment. And then uh, as Siobhan was talking about looking at team dynamics from a psychology perspective, but also looking at team dynamics from a, um, a, a, a functional perspective as well is really, really important. You know, harmonious and effective groups are essential for optimal mission outcomes. And we're looking at um, astronaut candidates and, and crews that will be made of different genders, different professional backgrounds, different cultural backgrounds, um, different personality types. And those individuals need to be well suited to cope in isolated, confined and extreme environments and adapt to those environments for long periods of time. So looking at how they adapt to, for example, uh, extended periods of overwintering in Antarctica, where we're isolated from the outside world for nine months and completely dependent on ourselves for support and technology with telehealth support, for example, from uh, Australia. Um, is that a model that we therefore train astronauts with where we put them through a space analog environment on Earth before sending them on these extended long duration missions? So I guess my final slide is this one because this is what the astronauts would see as they uh, approach Mars. Um, they've been in, in, uh, in their capsule for months to years, depending on the, the, the life of the orbits and the location of the orbits. Um, and what we're, what we're doing is we're expecting the astronauts to land uh, and then function effectively and independently on the surface of Mars. Well, if we consider what happens when an astronaut comes back to Earth currently, you know, you have a support crew, you have a doctor on standby, you have numerous people ready to pull them out of the, uh, uh, out of the capsule. Uh, they've been in space for between six and 12 months. And you'll often see when they land an ashen look on their face because uh, their physiology is not a, uh, accustomed once they come back from space for an extended period, their physiology is not accustomed to being in a gravity environment again. Well, that's fine on Earth when you have, you know, a lot of people around to help. But what we need to prepare for is that we land this crew on Mars and that they can look after themselves. We need to optimise their physical health, their bone density, their muscle health, uh, their cardiovascular status, uh, all of these things so that when they land, that they can actually look after themselves uh, and that they can independently do that. And we're a long way from recognising um, and uh, facilitating that at the moment. And that's one of the big challenges for, for space medicine as well. So on that, I might uh, end, my, uh, end my slide sharing and hand back to Gordon for uh, Q&A. Thank you, John. And I, I appreciate uh, that wonderful overview of the challenges we face medically and physiologically. I, I am noting, though, that we are quite pressed for time, Roy. I do apologise for that. We're, we're running a bit short. But I do notice we have a question from the audience, which I'd like to direct to uh, Siobhan. Um, and in fact, to uh, this is also going to John. Um, does your research address the relationship between the Earth's magnetic field and uh, Earth-based human health and the potential health impacts of space crews leaving our magnetic field for extended duration? So Siobhan, I might uh, throw that to you first. Yeah, that's probably actually more in John's um, area, but certainly for um, sleep health, um, where we really see the impact of being in those kind of microgravity environments 
um, already. Um, and that's with, you know, being on space station, which is still obviously relatively close to the Earth, um, you know, has great impact. So we know that there's quite a lot of work that needs to be done about understanding how we're going to manage um, sleep and make sure that people can actually sleep on board these uh, environments. But John might have more to say. Actually, before I throw to John, I was just going to ask beyond the magnetic uh, field radiation is uh, obviously a key concern. Do you think radiation interacts with human brain function, behaviour, psychology and changes? Of I mean, it absolutely does, um, you know, and we, we know that cognition, um, it, you know, is affected, brain is affected. Um, and so how, how that's going to play out and, you know, as John suggested, you know, the, the countermeasures that are going to be needed in order to protect humans from that kind of environment um, obviously, if there's a major solar event, then um, a lot of uh, human systems are going to be affected. Um, but over that long, long period, there are going to be insidious effects of the radiation on cognomens. Thanks, Siobhan. John, do you have comments to add? I'll just quickly add, you know, the, the photo that's sitting behind me at the moment is a great example of uh, the protection that is afforded to us by Earth's magnetic field. So you can see, you know, an incredible aurora that we witnessed a few weeks ago here at Davis Station that lit up the, the night sky and lit up the snow. And, and that's an interaction between the uh, charged particles from the sun and uh, the upper layers of the atmosphere and, and various gases in the atmosphere. The Earth's magnetic field, we see those at the pole because the, at the, at the poles because the, of the direction of the magnetic fields into or out of the Earth at the poles. The Earth's magnetic field pr pr provides a protection for us from the majority of, of radiation from the sun, not all of it. But as soon as we step outside the protective bubble of our, our, our planet and we're away from that magnetic field, the exposure to radiation and the, the protection afforded to us reduces to whatever the environment is around us. So the, the sides of the spaceship, uh, the, the clothing that's being worn, the shielding that might be worn, uh, potentially, you know, water around the spaceship, those sorts of things that could be used for shielding. Um, so the, the Earth's magnetic field really is essential for providing that radiation protection for us and as I said in that short presentation radiation is one of the major risk factors for, for emission to Mars that we aren't, aren't sure how to overcome yet and there's many challenges with uh, overcoming that uh, that present to us. Right thank you John. Uh, Roy look I, I must say I do have some other questions for panellists but I am cognizant of time and I'm more than happy to throw back to you as the uh, the chair of the session to, well, to wind up if you wish. Well thank you thank you so much this is su such a rich conversation it's it, I hesitate to cut anyone off <laughs> but I think we are a little bit pressed for time. I, I mean, may I indulge myself however by asking uh, two interrelated questions. M many of the examples that you've uh, developed so beautifully have illustrated the importance of Australia to this whole enterprise. Um, however, I'm mindful of the fact that even John is wearing a NASA uh, sweatshirt, right? Uh, to, and so I'm prompted to ask, to what extent do you fear or do you welcome the prospect of Australia as being part of the American enterprise? That is to say, NASA's enterprise, but the, uh, this goes to the geopolitics of it all. And related to that is the question, have you drawn at all upon the experience of other countries, of uh, Europe in the first place, of China, and more broadly speaking, uh, because there are important projects along parallel lines uh, being undertaken elsewhere. Uh, we have a little project in Sydney, in fact, uh, sponsored by the China Studies uh, Center, looking at habitational uh, structure work, academic work in China, several places uh, habitational structures, which are separate from the Chinese space industry, but nonetheless proceed, seem, we, we seem to think that they rhyme, so to speak, with the activities being undertaken in the West. Uh, do you learn from that experience at all? Uh, is there any exchange of information going back and forth? I'm, I'm thinking of the kinds of things that may come to have geopolitical importance in the cooperation of uh, our countries in space. When we land on Mars, certainly when we land on the moon, we won't be the first, and we won't be alone. <laughs> and possibly this is going to be the case on Mars as well. Uh, so I, I want to just, just in, in 30 seconds, <laughs> uh, I wonder if any of you has, has, has thought about that, or perhaps we can correspond about it in, in future. Is, is there any quick reaction? My quick reaction would be yes. 
and welcome collaboration. And, um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we've probably all worked with various different agencies. And, um, you know, I think it's really important for Australia to develop its own sovereign capability, but there's lots of lessons to be learned and lots of collaborative opportunities, I think, for um, the future. I'd also add from a medical perspective, I think, you know, the, there are lessons to be learned from the decades of human spaceflight that have preceded where we are today. Uh, but there are also unique opportunities for Australia as well. We have uh, a tremendous uh, uh, vast distances across our country and, and we provide some of the best medical care to rural and, and remote populations and extremely remote populations anywhere in the world. Uh, that coupled with the, the excellent work of the Australian Antarctic Program medically over many, many decades uh, provides a test bed for, um, you know, providing medical support to astronauts that really no other country in the world can offer in the same capacity. So uh, I think international collaboration is absolutely essential for optimal outcomes for, for this, uh, this research and these objectives. But I think Australia stands positioned to uh, provide a, a leadership within this space. Um, and I think the, the advancement of the Australian Space Agency is something to be celebrated because it provides an avenue for us to do that. Yeah, I'll uh, just add that absolutely we have to leverage our competitive advantages and the Australian Space Agency has recognised that in agriculture we are leading the way globally um, with many of our advances, but we have to be in, you know, interconnected with the global effort and we are. And um, yeah, that's the way forward. We can leverage our technologies for both use here on Earth that we develop and also um, those uh, issues in space as well. So yeah, it's, it's a, a delight collaborating with people around the world, but also leading certain efforts from Australia. Well, thank you. Well, with that <laughs> um, optimistic note, and inspiring note, uh, may I thank you all, Gordon. Uh, thank you for bringing together such a wonderful group of people. And thank you for uh, all of you for taking uh, the time um, to present uh, to a wider audience and of course to the audience that is unseen um, as yet as well. Uh, let me just advertise very quickly the um, next two uh, sessions which will be on Thursday of this week. I hope you can uh, fit one or two in uh, on Thursday at 11, Defending Science, um, which will be from the defense force point of view, more or less, taking up a range of subjects. I hope all of you will have had the complete program. Yes, and if not, please access it through the ASA website. Also on Thursday, we will have a session at two o'clock in the afternoon on space diplomacy and the presence of space law and regulation, the particular contribution that Australians are making to this domain. So please try to catch these and see the interconnections between what everybody is doing. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> uh, happy travels. <laughs> Stay safe. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye now. Thank you, everyone.